Well, good evening, everyone. Um, so, my name is Dr. Brian Ogle. We'll kind of go over a few things together here in a few minutes. Um, this evening, we're going to examine this question: Do we really, or do we actually need zoos? And I'm going to ask you to keep that question in the back of your head as we move throughout. Okay. Um, one of the important things, though, um, is that we're going to examine some very critical questions, and we're going to talk about some very um, kind of controversial topics uh, as we go throughout this evening. Um, so I just want you to be prepared for that. So I, we're going to have some interesting conversations, um, and we're going to have this opportunity to examine the issue of, of zoos and captive wildlife from both perspectives on both sides. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, is I want to put a context to this conversation. Um, and I think it's really important because I've already gotten a couple of hate emails, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, um, about this topic and about this presentation tonight. Um, it is important to know that I am heavily involved in zoos. I, I am what you could classify as pro-zoo, so I want you to keep that in mind as we do that. However, I'm very realistic about our flaws, our weaknesses as, as a community within the industry that we call zoological, um, you know, or zoology and all that stuff. Um, and some of the things that we have as far as pitfalls with exhibiting captive wildlife. And as an industry, we have to be able to look inwards and we have to be able to have that self-reflection in order to move forward and do best by what it is we're trying to do. Um, with that said, uh, as Daryl said, I am an assistant professor of anthrozoology. I lead the anthrozoology program at Beacon College, um, which is very exciting. So we look at many of these issues in context. And in particular, this is my area of focus. And I teach our zoo and aquarium management course, as well as our zoo biology course as well. Um, I've been employed by four different accredited facilities. Um, so I've been employed at three AZA facilities and one ZAA facility. I know that means nothing to you right now. We'll talk about that, what that means. Um, I have visited 25% of all AZA accredited facilities in the United States, and I try to add one or two every single year, um, if not more. Uh, and I serve on several committees for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So I am the education advisor uh, for the uh, FELID tag. This is the group of individuals responsible for managing all of the captive cats that you see in zoos. So ranging from your small sand cats all the way up to your large um, or tigers. So we manage them from a population standpoint, um, education, exhibiting practices, behavior, nutrition, all that stuff. Um, so I focus on the education realm of that and how we edu educate not only our guests, but also the people that work with these animals on a daily basis. And then I'm one of the individuals who work on the North American Species Survival Plan. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and then I'm also um, heavily involved in our CERVID um, taxon advisory group for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So I am very heavily involved. <laughs> so I just wanted that context to be there as we're going through this conversation. Because um, again, it's important to understand that I'm coming at a place where, yes, there are issues. Yes, there are problems. But we also have to look at both sides of the argument. And my goal is to bring both of those sides to life. Um, we can't have one without the other. Um, so I just want to put that context in there. But it's important to know, too, as we're talking about this whole idea of do we need zoos, right? That's our central question for the night. Do we need zoos? It's important to, for us to really look at this idea of what is a zoo, right? We have to define that. Um, in the United States, there are 2,800 licensed animal exhibitors. Okay, so these are groups, agencies, educational facilities, wildlife rehabilita rehabilitation. Sorry, guys, it's been a wrong day. <laughs> been teaching all day. Um, but it, there's multiple different varying spectrums of these licensed exhibitors that put animals on in front of the public, right? And those could be domestics. They could be exotic species. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily call them a zoo, and that's important to understand. Um, and it, there's actually a set defined criteria in which that separates these facilities apart that actually can classify them as a zoo and what we make them and what we kind of understand as a working group as a zoo. Um, so when we look at this criteria, we're looking at the, the fact that they maintain an accreditation beyond just what the USDA states, okay? Do you guys know in general what the requirements are, generally speaking, not necessarily exactly, but generally speaking, for most animals are set forth by the USDA to house a cat or in a, any type of exotic animal in front of the public? Essentially, the regulations state that the animal needs enough space for it to physically stand up, turn around, and lay back down again, and that's it. That's the amount of space required by law, right? Um, and then plus proper sanitation and a, what is classified as a nutritional diet, which can often be very lax in how that's defined. 
Um, when we talk about a zoo, a zoo goes beyond and above these you know, standards, right? So even when we look at some of our older facilities that may not have you know, these large updated exhibits, they're still above and beyond what the current federal regulations or even the state regulations may be. Their, the accreditation process um, is that they're reviewed by peers in their field. So they actually go through an inspection process during a timed period in which that they have uh, peers from other institutions come in and actually evaluate and look at all of these different things within the facility against an established criteria. And that's really important to know that there is a, a constant review process. And they're set forth um, in the rigorous standards and they are very rigorous um, and they don't range just from how we care for the animals, but it also looks at marketing. It actually looks at the business development aspect of the facility, it looks at education, it looks at research and conservation. So there's a whole well-rounded kind of standard that exists um, and they are reviewed against those by their peers in their field. There's two recognized um, accreditation bodies in the United States. We have the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and then we have the Zoological Association of, uh, of, Zoological Association of America. So we have the AZA and that's our juggernaut. That is the one that you strive to, that's kind of like the gold standard. That is what we typically think of with most of our major zoos that we recognize. So most of our municipality zoos, state ram facilities, different things along those lines. Those are the guys that are, that are under that umbrella. The standards are actually so rigorous that out of that 2,800 you know, animal exhibitors that exist in the United States, less than 10% actually meet the standard to be called a zoo. And that's really important to know. So, the AZA is kind of that gold standard. Then there's the ZAA, which is a different kind of philosophy, a different management philosophy. They still have a rigorous set of standards, but their guiding core philosophy is a little different than that of the AZA. But they're still going above and beyond the federal and state regulations, and they're working together as a collaborative group to meet the same kind of goals and objectives. Just maybe a little bit of a different philosophy from their, their sister institutions. Um, within these accreditation bodies, they both all align to having professional staff. We're gonna talk about this idea in a little bit too. This is what sets them apart, is the professional staff. The staff that is committed to this institution, committed to their, their area of expertise, and, and really dedicating their life to this, this work. And all the facilities that are accredited maintain not only just a commitment to exhibiting animals at the best quality level that they possibly can, but they're actually going above and beyond and looking at conservation, they're looking at education, and they're looking at research. All facilities that are accredited have to have at least one full-time person devoted to having a, a person in education. They all have to be involved in some sort of conservation-based efforts as well. Um, when we take a look at these facilities, and we, we can actually set them apart, one of the common questions, and this is where we'll get into this conversation too, is that they're not all for no, or non-profit facilities as well. And that's important to know. Many of our ZAA facilities are actually for-profit ventures, right? Even within the AZA, we have for-profit ventures as well. Can you guys think of maybe one or two that, that are in our area even? Some of my students are here, they should be able to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not Gatorland, so that's a good guess. They're actually not accredited. Um, so I'll give you a, a big example. There's one just right down the road, so SeaWorld Orlando, right? SeaWorld Orlando to, is actually an AZA accredited facility, um, even though they're for profit. Disney's Animal Kingdom is actually considered to be one of the leaders in this field, and they're also accredited by AZA. Bush Gardens is also accredited by AZA, right? So we see these large mega facilities that are for profit, but they're still following these standards as well. And this is where sometimes we start getting into difficult conversations because their goals, their objectives, are not always the same or don't always align with maybe some of the other facilities that we see, such as our small Sanford Zoo, the Central Florida Zoo, right? Mm -hmm. So when we take a look at this picture, this is a, a common thing that we're gonna see, okay? There's a lot of things in this picture that make us question whether or not animals should even be in captivity, right? So the animal is not on exhibit, and I, this part is why I selected this photo. I took this photo just this past weekend. The animal is not on exhibit, right? So when we take a look at this, we see a couple of features that we typically think of as a zoo. We see some sort of barrier, right? We see something that's enclosing and encasing our animal. Um, a lot of times you see the, the human manipulation aspect of it, so we see the netting, we see those pillars, we kind of have that, that traditional feel of a cage, right? However, if you look beyond that, you see a little bit more, right? You don't see the bars, right? Bars are kind of gone by the wayside. We don't see that very often anymore. 
these are more supports to support this, this mesh. This is actually designed to hold a peregrine falcon. So it's a very large area, right? Very large enclosure for a small bird of prey, which often many times you see just in a small mew. Okay. You also see a commitment to um, education. So right here is an educational graphic talking about not only what this animal is, why is it here at this zoo, and what is the zoo doing to help peregrine falcons out in the wild, right? So it's connecting, there's an attempt to make an effort. Now, with that being said, we know these are not effective, right? Research shows that these signs are not effective. People don't read them. People don't read signs in general. Um, however, there's still an attempt at some form of education, right? And then this individual here, this is often a stereotype, right? So when you think of the word zookeeper, what do you think of? Like, what are some of these words or adjectives that pop into your head? What do you think? Teacher. Okay, so a teacher. It's more of a modern twist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, feed the animals. Feed the animals, absolutely. What else? Scientist. Scientist, science, good. These are all modern words, right? Mm -hmm. if, you would ask, if I would ask that question 20 years ago, you, these words would not have been used, <coughs> right? Oftentimes we have this cliche that zookeepers are uneducated, that they do this job because they can't do anything else, right? That this is the only thing that they're qualified to do, um, or that they, they lack some sort of training to get a real job, right? That used to be a very heavily based cliche, and that's not true. Right? We go back to the standard, the professional staff. Professional staff is just not the managers that manage the facility or the researchers that work in the facility or the veterinarians. It goes all the way down to our keepers. In fact, we don't even utilize the word zookeeper anymore. Right? This is an animal care professional. Right? That is the true title of this person. So when we look at this animal care professional here, this individual is maintaining the exhibit to make sure that the welfare of the animal is not being compromised. Right? This individual is making sure that the animal is living in a clean and sanitary exhibit. This individual also is responsible for monitoring and tracking daily behaviors, daily food intake, prepping the diet to make sure the animal is healthy. Right? They're also involved in training the animal to participate voluntarily in their own care and their own um, ability to, to go through veterinary procedures. In addition, this person has a degree. Right? They have a specialized degree. This person more than likely has at least a bachelor's degree in a specialized field, oftentimes related to something with, with the care of the animals. This person probably also spent their whole entire collegiate career doing internships and job shadowing experiences to get to this point, to be able to set themselves up for a career. In many facilities, we would even see that this person has a master's degree as well. So these guys are highly trained. They truly are professionals. They really are animal care professionals. They strive to provide the highest quality experience of life for the animal. They make scientific based decisions and they're really going above and beyond just managing fecal matter at the end of the day. They're doing so much more. And it's an important consideration to have. This is a stereotype and it's often a stereotype that we still combat within the industry. Many times this is also a criticism of zoos as well, that they don't have people who are qualified to be taking care of the animals. Many times we say that there are individuals that are just here because they don't have another type of job or they can't get another job, when in fact this whole person spent their, their career dedicated to getting to this point to get this job and to maintain that job. This is at the same facility, actually just right around the corner in the same exhibit space. So here we see another animal care professional working and training with this harbor seal. What's really cool is the lead up to this area or to this moment. So when I first approached this exhibit, I was just a general guest, right? I was just hanging out, enjoying my day at the zoo. When I approached the exhibit, this animal was not here. This, uh, this exhibit is much larger, and actually this animal is more like clear off where we would see behind the screen, um, and actually behind kind of an area out of public view. You couldn't see the animal, and they were training. This animal is actually going through a training process to help it maintain and to be able to participate in voluntary medical procedures. So one of the things that because of facilities like this, we know that these type of animals have a very difficult time in captivity with their eyes. Their eyes actually degrade pretty rapidly. So this animal is actually going through training to undergo an ultrasound on the eyes to actually maintain a look at the eyes, right? And one of the things that you have to do in order to do an ultrasound on a seal is you have to have them underwater. They have to be able to hold their breath underwater and you have to be able to put the ultrasound right on their eye. So that animal is going through this training process through that, right? How do you think I know this? You did it. I did, that's a great guess, right? I've been involved in it, I've done it. And that's not the case at all. This individual took her time to actually talk to us about this, 
right? She, this is one of those epitome, like this is one of those moments. And actually I had a whole different presentation lined up for you guys tonight. And after my moment, after my day at the zoo, I changed the whole entire thing based off of not only this interaction, but the other one that we're gonna look at as well. Because this is how it's done. This is exactly what we should be doing as a whole industry. This is the commitment to the welfare, the commitment to the conservation efforts that we're looking at, but now we're pulling in our guests, we're getting them involved, and we're opening up to that transparency. We're letting them know what's happening, right? We, the training could have very, been, very easily have been done behind the scenes where no one could have seen it, right? And instead, this individual, who I give a lot of credit to, this individual saw myself and then this family walk up and saw that we were watching what was happening, brought the animal, all the way over to the other side of the exhibit to right here to go through that training process and then walked us through what she was doing in that moment. She didn't have to do that. That wasn't a scheduled presentation. That wasn't a scheduled thing that was supposed to happen. She just saw an opportunity to go out of her way to educate a group of guests who are interested in the animals that she cares for. That's it's amazing, right? So again, going back to this whole idea, a commitment of professional, fa or professional staff a commitment to education beyond just our traditional signage and the whole idea of what we define as education in a zoological facility. So in these moments here is when you actually get the opportunity to really kind of see the shape and the evolution of these facilities, right? And one of the important things that we need to realize is that it wasn't always this way. And we have to be realistic about that. We have to own the fact that it has not always been this way and that these animals have not always been receiving this type of care, right? So the animal protection movement in particular, this is one of the areas that we really have to give credit to, right? There was actually, I don't think the modern facility would exist or would be where we are today if it was not for the animal protection movement, right? So as much as we can say we don't enjoy or we have a hard time with animal activists, we have a hard time with you know, those that what we would say claim to the vegan um, you know, agenda and things like that, they're important because they're, they're our, our watchdog, right? They have to be there, otherwise we could get away with things that we shouldn't be getting away with, right? Um, one of the important things too is that just because you are evaluated by a group of your peers, there's a collective knowledge and a, a kind of a collective understanding that exists amongst peers, right? We kind of get in this mindset that this is okay, this is an acceptable behavior, this is the way it's always been done. It's when you have people from the outside looking and be like, why are you doing this? Right? Why does that exist? Why is this happening? Is when you start reevaluating and looking in on yourself. Um, so I quicken the evolution of the modern zoo, right? We can look at how the zoos evolved all the way from the Victor Victorian area where we had them in big lush gardens behind the bars, um, those traditional Victorian style of exhibits. And you can go to some places that still go back to those exhibit models, right? Um, the St. Louis Zoo is a great example. So they actually have a whole exhibit area called Historic Hill, where they maintain their buildings that were built in the 1900s, the early 1900s, and they actually demonstrate the evolution of zoos. So they show this is the way it's been done, and it's not okay anymore. So this is the way we do it now. And it's really cool. So they keep the old style architecture, they keep showing off how this is what it used to be, and then you turn around the corner and there's this big multi-million dollar exhibit that's beautiful, right? And so they really do a good job of showing you where we've come from and where we've been. Um, in the 1960s, this is really important, is that there was a crisis that existed. Um, and one of the important things that we cannot get away from and the things that we cannot ignore, and this is gonna be a conversation that will, or a theme that will pop up again, um, all of those 2,800 licensed animal exhibitors exist for one reason. Right, they're in operation for one reason. And what is that one reason? What do you guys think? Entertain. Entertain, right? Entertainment, recreation. We can't deny that. We can't hide that fact, right? We know that. What we can do, though, is we can shift how that happens and what ha how do we define entertainment and how do we define recreation. Um, and so back in the early 60s, leading up to this point, they were almost a glorified stationary circus to a certain extent. They really were. Um, and those were some dark days for some facilities. There are there some things that they don't enjoy that they won't admit to their past or that they question, why did we do this? Or if you look back at it, um, there were some serious issues, some serious things that happened. Because of the animal protection movement, zoos within this time period kind of went through this crisis where they either faced collapsing or evolving, right? Either we collapse or we keep going. Um, and so they rebounded and now they're more popular than ever. As a matter of fact, about 100, 181 million people visit an AZA accredited facility every single year. 
that's more than all of your professional sport leagues combined, right? So it is one of the major sources of entertainment in the United States. Um, we look at the modernization of exhibits, and then we also start looking at the shift of moving towards the conservation and education focused mission, right? So if we see this, if we see that they're trying, if they're moving forward, if they're evolving, if they're trying to go past this past, why do we still have these questions, right? Why do we still struggle with zoos? Why do we still have this issue with them? Why do we still question, like, do we need zoos, right? If this is the case, if we know that we're doing well, we have modern exhibits, we're focused on conservation, we're focused on education, why am I here with you tonight asking the question, do we even need them, right? So when we look at this whole idea, we look at the question of mission success. <coughs> Many people, including myself sometimes, will, I will ask these questions. Can zoos even actually add to conservation? Do they have a legitimate conservation role, right? Is just breeding species or breeding animals to be held in captivity with the, never the intent to be released in the wild, is that really conservation, right? Is there a significant contribution to breeding endangered species due to the limited size of zoo properties? We are limited by enclosure space. There's no question about that. That's one of the roles that the species survival programs play is managing the need for how do we maintain biodiversity or genetic diversity with the limited space we have in zoos, right? And zoos have to make difficult decisions. When, why should I put in a five acre deer exhibit when I can put in a tiger exhibit and get more cats for the bigger bang of my buck, right? So why would we do that? Um, we're also looking at their ability to meet the needs or the welfare of every single animal of every single species. And many times this goes, we can question, you know, is that welfare of that animal being impacted? And then we also look at this whole idea of morality, right? Do we keep a sentient living being in captivity just because we know it's going to be used for entertainment? Right? Do, there are some, some questions that we struggle with that. We have to look at the ethical framework in which that we operate. So these are some legitimate questions that many people like answer or try to answer and try to ask on a regular basis. So that's why we're here tonight having that conversation. Do we even need them? Do we need a zoo in our life? Do we need to have as many zoos that we have? And there's some examples within the past couple of years that bring these questions to the forefront. All four of these questions can be asked about the same situations, right? So I'm gonna start with this one first because I think a lot of people recognize these ones, so I'm gonna skip those real quick and look at this one. Do you guys recognize what this animal is? African, African wild dog. Yeah, it's African painted dog, African wild dog, right? A couple of years ago in Pittsburgh, a small child was ripped apart by a pack of these animals, right? So we look at, again, the whole idea of morality. Are, are zoos doing what they should be doing, right? So we look at the fact that a visitor breached a barrier, whether intentionally or not, right? This was an accidental thing. Mom lifted the, the toddler up to go be able to get a better view. She lost control of the toddler, animal, or the dropped in the animal enclosure. Dogs got them. We also look at Harambe, similar incident. Child breached a containment, right? Entered in with a large silverback gorilla. This gorilla ended up paying the price for that, right? Again, we look at the morality issue. We look at, are we doing enough? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Of course, in Orlando, in this area, you know, this is one of the key things that we constantly face, right? Do these animals belong in captivity? We know they're dangerous, right? Why are the trainers, why were they used to be able to be allowed in the water when we knew they were dangerous? Why do we use them as a source of entertainment the way that we have, right? We look at the, the dropped dorsal fin, right? That's a sign of something's not right either. We know that's not as common in the wild as it is in captivity. So why do all of our captive whales have this when only 10% of them in the wild do? Right. So again, we're looking at the welfare, we're looking at the science, we're looking at what we do. Elephants are a big one. Just in the past week alone, four elephants have died in captivity that are under the age of a, of a year and a half of age because of improper care. Right. So when we take a look at these and we look at this whole idea of what's going on with different animals, we go back to these questions on a regular basis. Right, we go back to these questions and we ask, what is happening in each of these photos and what is happening in each of these that still allow us to continue to do what we do and why do we need these facilities in our life? Right, if we know that there's issues, if we have dangerous animals in captivity that pose a threat to human life, why are they around? Why do these facilities create moments or create the opportunities 
for guests to breach containment to be able to get in with the animals in the first place. Right? And again, this is from the North Carolina Zoo. Okay, and again, I want to put context and I want to frame this really quick. This is one of the nicest polar bear exhibits I have ever seen. Right, I will commend North Carolina to the T and I will tell, like, this is a beautiful exhibit, right? This exhibit um, is a three acre exhibit. It's huge for a polar bear area. It features one of the largest areas for land. A lot of times we don't see polar bears given a lot of access to land, right? They don't spend a lot of time in the water, believe it or not. They do, but not a lot. So they have a beautiful land-based area that's multiple levels, all completely grass and sodded, beautiful trees. It's, if you didn't know that, you're stand, you swear you were standing on the tundra. It was a beautiful, beautiful exhibit. And then this is one of the largest polar bear pools I've ever seen. So it is a beautiful exhibit. It's, again, it's a three acre exhibit in total. And then the back holding space is 5,000 square feet. Massive building, right? Massive space for these animals. So I want you to take a look at this really quick. And I'm gonna show you this really fast. And I want you to, to look at it and examine what you see. Tell me what you saw. Tell me what you think. What, tell me what you feel. He by so look at so Yeah. He felt so happy, I guess. Okay, so happy, right? That's a word to describe that, right? Yeah. I hear our audience anthropomorphizing these animals. Oh, we'll get into anthropomorphism. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> happy yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't get <laughs> what else do you do you think? What else do you? What made you? What, how did you feel? Calm, right? Does this animal seem content? Yes. yes. Okay. I don't think he Is it nervous. active? Yes. Yeah, okay. This, that little segment right there. So I took that segment, I posted it with my social media, a couple of social media accounts, right? It's one of the best like received videos I've had in a long time, right? Because again, the animal's close, the animal's there. I'm gonna show you the rest of this video, okay? And I just want you to watch. And I want you to, again, have that reaction. Tell me what you think, tell me what you feel. It's a little different when you see the full thing, yeah. right? He's scary the, same uh -huh. the reason why I was able to get some of the best photos I've ever gotten in my life with this, this animal was doing this for five minutes before I got there. I was able to predict every single thing that animal was doing. It continued to do this for 10 minutes when I stayed. The 15 minute sequence of the same pattern. This is stereotypic behavior at its finest, right? So not only is it just the same pattern, Okay, because we'll get in, we could talk about patterning, right? So if we look at like our large cats, right? Typically what we think of as pacing is not actually pacing. It's what we would call a patrolling behavior. Because when you take that same animal, put them in a different context, the behavior may be extinguished or may be different because of the size of the enclosure, right? When we take a look at something like this and you see the same patterning happening, not only was it the same pattern, it was almost down to the same, same T, movement. right? Same movement. I could count how many steps that animal would take. I could go exactly to what point in the glass that animal was going to turn around or go through. The pause in between was almost identical, right? This is stereotypic behavior, right? This animal has one of the best enclosures in the world, has one of the best habitats in the world, has one of the best care staff that's out there. It's still developed stereotypy, right? Bears in general do this. You can provide them with one of the best exhibits out there. You can provide them with the best enrichment programs out there, one of the best training programs. They will always develop stereotypy, right? Begs the question, 
does this animal belong in captivity? Are we doing wrong by this animal at this point? Right? So even though we have provided this animal with everything we can to be successful, and even with the training and enrichment program to fully successfully live a life, it's still doing this. It's still developing a, a form of a mental health disorder. Right? Now here's what the other thing's gonna happen. We're gonna watch this video one more time. And I want you to pay attention to what else is going on, because now I'm gonna put the audio with it. <coughs> wow. Wow. Is that the polar bear? It's jumping. It's jumping? So when that moment happened, that's when I threw my old presentation away and I started over, right? These are those moments that, you know, I'm sorry, I've been working with animals my whole life and I do everything I can to be working with them and to, you know, do the best by them and to train an army of minions who are going to go out and do this for me, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you struggle with these motions and you struggle with those moments of what are we doing? Right? What are we doing with this animal that is causing this to happen? Why do we still think it's okay to keep these animals in captivity when we know that they're going to develop these issues? Right? Same with elephants. We can look at many different things. So the other thing that's really striking with that whole conversation is then we look at the clash of what happened with that visitors. Right? That family had no idea. They weren't even aware of what was going on. You guys picked up on that really quickly. But again, it kind of like led you with a carrot to get there <laughs> and it kind of framed it. But they were perfectly fine with what they were seeing in front of them. And that to me is the hardest part, right? That as a group of humans, collectively, we have decided that this behavior is okay and that this is all right because I'm going to get all the cool stuff on social media and I'm going to get the, those likes and I'm going to get that reaction or I'm going to have that opportunity to be up and close to an animal because that's what I want to see, right? It's tough. You, you, that's where, again, this is where that conversation, do we need these facilities, it comes into play again. This is when we start having that conversation and looking at it. One of the things that we look at is we look at all these animals. All these animals share many things in common with each other. Let's start with our polar bear friend right here since we've just been talking about polar bears. So for those of you, really quick, when we take a look at these animals and what they all have in common, how many of you have grandkids? Okay. It is highly probable, highly probable that within your grand, by the time your grandkids are my age, all of these animals will be extinct. Not only will they be extinct in the wild, there is a high probability these animals will be extinct in captivity as well. What? High probability. That's scary to think about, right? We look at our polar bears right here. We know they're dwindling in the wild. We know that they're facing an incredible uphill challenge right now. We know that is. Regardless of your thoughts on climate change or what the causes are, anything like that, we know it's happening. We know that the, the ice is melting. We know these animals are dying and perishing at a quicker rate than they have before. We can't deny that. We see the population numbers. We see it happening, right? In captivity, 20 years ago, there were 200 of these animals. Anyone you know how many we have in captivity right now? Yeah. How many? Is it in the hundreds? In North America, we have 60 polar bears right now. Right? In North America, we have 60 of these animals. We only have 11 breeding pairs. Right? There are only 11 breeding pairs of polar bears. So the North Carolina Zoo, despite what was going on, despite what we saw that stereotypic behavior, are one of those 11 that have a breeding pair. And they're highly likely to be successful in their breeding. Yeah. We look at elephants and we look at orangutans. These two in particular, you know, they have major, major considerations about being in captivity. Right? Elephants are one of my favorite animals, absolute favorite animals. And I still reconcile with the fact that they, we have them in captivity and whether we should even have them in captivity, right? 
But the scary thought is, 96 of these animals die every single day because of poaching and habitat loss. A day. We lose 96 animals a day, right? We look at orangutans. Orangutans are, again, they're incredibly intelligent, incredibly sentient, as all of our great apes are. We lose 20 of them to 25 of them a day because of the palm oil crisis, because of habitat loss. So if we can't have them in zoos, where do they go? Right? Gone are the days that we actually have a wild. Gone are the days where a wild exists, that the roaming plains of Africa exists, where we could have these animals. That's not there anymore. It's not there. And poachers are incredibly intelligent. Right? They do this because they make money, and they do it because there's no other alternative for them. Right? There really is no other alternative. So when, when elephants are being poached because of drones, because they're able to use and employ drones to track these animals, we have a big issue, right? African penguins are actually completely uh, being wiped out and being decimated because of human Im impact on multiple levels. Oil spill is a huge one with these birds. The destruction of habitat. These guys actually build their nests out of their own dung. I know that sounds crazy, but they do. And it's really cool is that guano is actually the perfect thermoregulator, right? They build colonies in almost like kind of like these um, condos out of this like this guano that just keeps building up and building up and building up. And it is the perfect thermal insulator and regulator. And is what they exactly need to be able to get their chicks to hatch. Right? It's the perfect place for them to be able to raise their chicks and be able to lay their eggs. That guano is awesome fertilizer for us. So we go in and we harvest it. We take these colonies out and we take all that out. So we actually destroy and dismantle all these, these, these big, beautiful like structures to make fertilizer. Right? The monarchs are going to be pretty quickly decreasing. And this is all because we don't like milkweed. They have to have milkweed in order to lay their eggs because it's the only thing they lay their eggs on. It's the only thing the caterpillar eats. We think it's ugly and unattractive. We take it out. We destroy the habitat. We use pesticides because we want to get rid of a certain pest, but we also get rid of them at the same time. Pesticides kill all insects. It's not discriminant, right? It will kill anything, beneficial or not beneficial. The Puerto Rican crested toad has no habitat left, but, this is, <clears throat> but they're kind of making a comeback. And then the sand tigers. Sharks in general are in big trouble, guys. You know, their oceans are being overfished. Our oceans are not as sustainable as we once thought they were. And then we also have issues with these guys being hunted for fins as well as for sport and for trophy as well. Mm -hmm. But again, all of these have something in common beyond just that first initial shock thing I told you. All, every single one of these species are involved in a species survival plan. Zoos are working collectively, not just as an individual zoo, but as a collective group of 280 facilities to be able to save these animals and working with their institutions in Europe, Asia, and Australia to make sure that collectively we're managed across the globe. Right? So there's a chance. There's a chance we can save them, but we have to save them in captivity, and we have to have a sustainable source of these animals in captivity, and we have to protect the habitat. Right? We can't breed, this is one of those big criticisms, zoos are breeding animals, but they're not being reintroduced in the wild. Well, if I know 96 elephants a day are being poached, is it more ethically irresponsible for me to breed animals to be put back out in Africa? Right? Am I making the right choice by breeding these animals for reintroduction just because I know it's another source that now it's a continual source of elephants coming into that habitat in which they can be poached, right? So there's a lot of things that we have to look at with that one. The other thing too is that all of these animals, when they live their lives in captivity, so again, we look at the individual, that one individual animal, that little girl in that video, that may be the only time she sees a polar bear, right? She may not be able to travel to the Arctic ring to be able to see a polar bear, but now she has a connection to that animal. That animal served as an ambassador for all polar bears and the, the problems that they're facing, she could potentially now be the one that also makes a difference. Right? So when we talk about conservation, zoos are very well positioned to halt global biodiversity loss. They're actually the best grouping of conservation or organizations to do this in this moment. No other, no other organization could do it. They're important players in the meta population management and they reach a global audience more effectively than any other conservation organization out there. And their education visitor messaging is critical, right? Just last year alone, the, uh, the AZA Collective, right, all the AZA institutions spent $220 million on conservation efforts and projects in 148 range countries. That's incredible, right? And those projects, you know, of, of all conservation projects that are out there right now, 
26% of them are actually led and staffed and actually kind of almost funded solely by zoos, right? Conservation efforts done by zoos focus on population monitoring. They focus on habitat evaluation and assessment, habitat restoration, and then reintroduction of selected species. So this Puerto Rican crested toad, we actually have facilities here in our state that are successfully have bred and reintroduced these animals into Puerto Rico, right, by the thousands. And that's really cool. And not only are they breeding these animals successfully, they have partners in Puerto Rico to help maintain that population, to help maintain that habitat, to restore that habitat, so these animals may continually exist in the wild and in captivity. It's pretty cool. When we talk about this whole idea of education, there are 3,700 individuals employed in an AZA facility whose whole job is to be an educator. So there is an army of 3,700 educators out there focused on this whole idea. And then in addition to that, there are 29,000 volunteers at, at zoos solely focused on education. That's incredible, right? That's a massive army going out and working with that. But the problem that we also know is that only 33% of all guests that walk through that front gate engage in anything educational related, mm -hmm. right? There's a mismatch. There's also a mismatch in between what zoos say that they want to do and what they're trying to achieve and what their education programming and their education departments actually do. There's a mismatch that exists within that. One of the other things too that's also really important is that zoos collectively, as a whole group, have 250 million followers across all social media platforms. That's massive, right? Again, they're more positioned to be well, to be positioned in this global biodiversity loss, both from a science and a conservation standpoint, a resource standpoint, as well as the access to the people who can make a change and who can fund the change. So when we talk about conservation, we look at this. This is a great example from the Brevard Zoo. So here you walk in. As soon as you walk in, you get a little token. And you put that token in this box. And in here are three different conservation projects that are supported by the zoo. You put that token in, and 25% of your emission rate goes into that project. So that's pretty cool, right? The Brevard Zoo in Melbourne, Florida, just an hour and a half away. So it's a phenomenal idea, right? You're getting your guests involved in, in uh, conservation. You're getting them involved in helping make this decision and actually funding it, right? My admission I paid money for is going directly to this project because that's where I put my token, right? That's neat for me as a visitor to be able to see that connection. Now let's back up and take a look at it. Again, we're gonna look at both sides of the argument. 25 cents of every admission. I pay $20 to get into this facility. It's 1%, right? 1% of that money I spent just went to conservation. But it's a difference, right? May not be a great difference. And part of the issue that we have to reconcile with this, and when we look at why do zoos not spend more, right? $220 million actually is not a lot when you look at 260 accredited facilities across the whole entire United States. It's actually not a lot of money. It's less than a million dollars per facility spent on conservation. But the reason for that is it's massively expensive to run these facilities. A zoo of this size, and a zoo, if you guys are familiar with the Zoo Tampa as well, it's a comparable facility, that is a 20 to $25 million operation every year just to keep the lights on, right? Zoos spend on average between one to $3 million just feeding their animals, right? And then we go back to the whole idea of professional staff. If I have animal care staff that are professionals that have a degree and who have maybe a graduate degree or do research, I have to comp fairly compensate them. Right? If we're doing research, research is expensive, conservation is expensive. So just to operate the facility, it's a lot. So that's again where we look at this mesh that exists and some of the misunderstandings that exist with these facilities. One of the other things that we have to look at with conservation is it's, li it's limited by the available funding. Right? Again, I have to pay to keep my doors open, I have to pay to keep my staff, and I have to pay to keep my animals fed. That's the priority. Right? That is my priority. However, the other thing too is this visitor demand for megafauna, right? And we'll talk about this whole idea here in a second. And also the visitor support for recognizable animals or high profile animals, right? That's the thing people give money to. And if you look at this example, if you could actually see, this is all centered around manatees and manta rays, right? This one was almost completely full. This one is centered around the key lager rat, which is incredibly important in, a, in what we consider to be a cornerstone species in Florida. I was one of few people that day who ever voted for it, Aww. right? There is a, a 
the visitors drive this. The visitors drive the conservation efforts of the facility. And so if you want the facilities to do better, we, as a collective group, we have to do better, right? So when they're not constrained by these issues, if they're not constrained by funding, if they're not constrained by the visitor demand to see these megafauna, if they're not constrained by able to see recognizable animals or to put money towards conservation of recognizable species, they can be doing better and they can be effective. We know that they're effective. The Puerto Rico crested toad is a prime example of that, right? This is a great example too. When we look at this, 52% of all conservation efforts supported by zoos are mammals. Right, 52 percent, and we know that's not true. When we look at the the diversity, majority of our animals are not mammals. Right, majority of even the vertebrate animals are not mammals, but yeah, majority of our conservation efforts go to mammals. Right, less than five percent of all conservation efforts actually go to fish, and there's one of the ones that need it the most right now. So there's this huge disconnect that exists, and I battle this. I'm in, like I, I face this right. So I serve on the CERVID um, Taxon Advisory Group, right? The CERVID Taxon Advisory Group, we're a group of individuals within EZA that looks at managing deer and deer-like species, right? At the end of the day, that's what we classify them as. Deer are not sexy. <laughs> I hate to bring it to you. And they're hard to exhibit. And they're hard for visitors to like, right? And it makes sense, because here in North America, we see the standard base model of a deer, the white-tailed deer, mule deer, we see those across the country. We also have some of one of the more unique species of deer. We have the largest species of deer as well. So we have elk, which are very, very cool, right? Very unique. And the largest species of deer, which is the moose, right? There's nothing cooler to see a wild moose running around, right? It is phenomenal. So when you all of a sudden have a red deer, or if you look at some of these other animals, some of the, the um, Asiatic species of deer, they look like a small elk. That's not interesting. Right? So we combat this whole idea of the visitor wanting to see this megafauna and recognizable animals. Right? And it becomes tough. And then we have federal regulations on top of it where we cannot move certain animals in and out of state lines, and we cannot move animals across the country. So at that point, zoos have their hands tied by the visitors and by the federal agencies and the regulations that exist. And they exist for good reasons, I will say that. But if they're born and bred in captivity, it may not be as applicable as we need to have them. Right? So when we reconcile with the visitor agenda, there are a couple of things that we need to look at. Again, they come to, to have a good time. Think about the last time you went to the zoo. You went to take your family. You went to have a good time. You went to spend time outside. You went to go look at animals, yes. right? You didn't go to be educated and to go learn about all these things, right? That's an accidental secondary thing that happens. And that's OK. That's really OK. But as a zoo, we need to do better to trick you into learning, right? We need to make those moments of, of that aha moment of, oh my gosh, I learned something, I saw something, I, I saw some behaviors. That example with the seal that I showed you at the very beginning is a prime example of that, right? Um, when we take a look at this as well, an average visitor spends four hours at a zoo and that's it. It's usually half a day and they're done, okay? Only 41% of that time is actually spent looking at an animal. Right? The remaining part of their visit, almost 60%, almost two-thirds of their visit, is actually spent interacting with their friends or family, just strolling and having a good time, shopping, eating, relaxing. Right? They're there to have a good time. The animals are secondary in nature. Right? They're supporting players. They might be a reason that drew you there, but at the end of the day, they're a supporting player in your actual kind of activity. The other thing that zoos face, and it's a really difficult one, Again, if, I, if it costs me $22 million just to run my facility every year, I have to get you to come back multiple times, and I have to get you to spend money there to be able to do that. And one of the problems with attracting you is that visitors only want large and active animals. There is a correlation that exists that the bigger the animal, the more exciting and more entertaining they are to the visitors, and the more likely they are to stay and look at that exhibit. The smaller the animal, the less likely you are to stay there and look at the animal. Same thing with activity. If we look at the same species of animal, if they're more active, they're going to stay. If they're less active, they're going to walk away, right? Mammals compared to other groups are also the most preferred by far. Like, it's not even a fair comparison to look at, at that. But mammals are the most preferred animals to look at. Birds are the least interesting to visitors. They could care less if they're or not. And we actually did the, a study, or not a study, but kind of like a mock experiment. Um, so I take my, I told you I teach the zoo and aquarium management class. And so we actually went with, we teach at Zoo Tampa every week, our psychology students with us one day too. And we actually did an experiment to look at how often are these animals actually being looked at and they're not. 
the average visitor would just walk right by a bird exhibit and not even give it a second chance, right? The minute they saw a mammal, they stop and look at it, right? So again, birds are not interesting. And what's really interesting is that reptiles and fish are way more interesting compared to birds. You wouldn't expect that, right? Especially considering birds are active, they're colorful, and they have the opportunity to display all sorts of cool behaviors. So it's really interesting to me that that's not the case because when you look at what do they prefer, birds should be in that lineup, okay? Um, so when we talk about this whole aspect here, and we look at that question of do we need zoos, when we look at this aspect here, and we, we need a place for our, to go to connect with our families. We know that we would prefer and generally spend more time and more of us go to a zoo compared to a sporting event, a professional sporting event, that tells us that yes, right? That we, as a society, that we, as an individual human, want to go to the zoo. There's something there, there's something that brings us there, something that makes us want to go there and that spends time there. There's a reason why I'm willing to go and spend four hours of my time and go look at animals and spend time with my family there, right? I guess at home and watch TV and spend time with four hours of my family watching something, right? But I'm choosing to go do that with the animals, right? It's because we have an innate connection to them. Animals make us feel something. Animals connect us back to what makes us human in many times. They, many times they model what actually makes us human and what appreciates us as a human. So from that aspect, as a society, as a well-rounded society, yes. And many times zoos are actually a direct reflection of our society and our views on animals as well. You can even look at an urban and a suburban or a rural type zoo and see drastic differences because again, of the comparison of the fact that rural individuals have a different perspective of animals because of the agricultural background, right? So you can see that many, many times. And for some people, especially in an urban environment, this is the only time they'll ever get to go see the rainforest, right? This is the only time that we're, they may ever be able to go see a polar bear. It's expensive to travel and it, it limits many, many people. So we look at these clear, critical questions and issues that we have to consider and keep reconciling with as we move forward is balancing the organizational goals with the objectives of those the visitor. What I want to do as an educator, what I want to do as someone who manages the education department is in direct contrast with what my visitors want. Someone who wants to manage an animal collection, if I want to be able to bring in a species fully for conservation because they are in desperate need of it, may not be able to go through because of the fact that it's not gonna bring people through the front door. Right, they're limited and they're contrasting because of the visitors. We also need to reshape our definition and expectations of conservation, right? Conservation literally means saving what we have right now, right? That's what conservation really means, is that we're saving what we have at this moment. And so conservation doesn't mean that I'm going forward and, and necessarily putting back. That's an important part of it. That's a modern component of conservation. But we have to kind of redefine this. Conservation can be habitat monitoring. It can be conservation education. It can be done in the habitat itself and outside of the habitat. Many times the reason why we're effective at saving animals in the wild is because of what we learn about them in captivity, right? So there's many things that we go and that we have to consider. And the biggest one of all is we have to look at improving the, the life of the individual, that individual, not polar bears overall, but that polar bear, right? We have to look at that polar bear in that specific facility. And we have to continue towards the area of transparency and openness, and we have to keep right-sizing our collection, which means that we're picking the right animals, the correct animals for not only the climate, but the resources I have available, my conservation plan, and what my visitors want to see, right? Balancing all those needs. And again, working within an ethical framework um, aligned with our mission and goals, right? I have a hard time when you go to a zoo and you go to a petting zoo, and they, or they have the children's zoo or petting zoo exhibit, and they're promoting kindness to animals and all these like empathetic things, understanding you know why we need animals in our life, and then literally walk across the street and get a hamburger, right? I, I always have a hard time with that. Uh, it doesn't line up. It clashes, right? Whether we think so or not, it does clash. Sometimes we're not putting sustainable practices into play, even though that's what we preach, right? So as a whole, the industry needs to look at that as well of practicing what we preach and walking what we walk. So what can you do as a visitor? So one of the, the big things is that visit only those accredited facilities. And they're easy to spot, they're easy to find. And if you ever have any doubt, you can go onto the websites, they'll tell you if they're accredited or not, or you can go to AZA's website, and there's a tab that says find an accredited zoo near me, right? 
gone are those days where we appreciate and even tolerate those roadside attractions. Right? Those are not zoos. They're not doing anything other than harming the individual animal at that time. So visiting only those accredited facilities. Participate in or donate to conservation projects. Many zoos are complete, like I said, 26% of, of conservation initiatives are led by zoos. There's ways to get involved with them. You can volunteer, you can donate directly to that. You can go like the Brevard Zoo and vote for which one that you wanna be involved in, right? The Brevard Zoo even has a whole thing that talks about how you can do conservation in your own backyard to save one of the projects or save one of the ecosystems they're working with. And then be willing to financially support a facility during your trip. And this is a big one. And I make an effort every time I go to a zoo that I'm going to eat at that zoo and I'm going to buy at least one thing from there because all that money goes back to them. And the more money that they make and the surplus that they run goes back to the animals or it goes directly back to conservation, right? When we stop limiting, you know, if we're spending $10 on that hot dog, that hot dog is $10 for a reason. It's a money maker for them, right? They need to be able to do that. Zoos have to make that money. So be willing to do that. Be willing to also spend time when you go on vacation and plan a visit to, to the zoo in that area. Sometimes there's some phenomenal facilities that really can make your, your, your vacation. San Diego comes to mind, right? That's a destination that people go to just to see that facility. But the North Carolina Zoo, many people don't even think about because they drive right by it. And it's one of the best zoos I've ever been to, right? So it's a great way to, to enhance your vacation, look at different things. And again, the average visitor only spends four hours. You can play a half day visit. It's okay, <laughs> everyone does it. <laughs> um, and one of the interesting things too is that 79% of all the visitors um, that see a corporate sponsorship, so if you're involved in managing corporate sponsorships or anything like that, 79% of the visitors that see corporate sponsorship on exhibits actually view those companies more favorably and view them more respectfully, and they're 66% more likely to actually go and buy a product or service from that, that sponsor. So something to kind of think about as well. Um, and ultimately, what you can do as well, um, when we talk about this whole idea of what can you do, is to not to hold the past against them, right? They know they messed up. They know that this is, this is not the way that it should be done. They're trying to move forward. The new generation is trying to move forward. You can't hold the past against them. You have to celebrate the successes and celebrate the milestones and work with them to not only enhance what it is that they're doing, but also to give them that credibility of doing that. And by, again, looking out for the accredited, like the accredited facilities only, right? Because those roadside attractions can bring down the whole entire group, but they're not classified as a zoo, right? They don't meet those standards. They're an attraction. They're an exhibitor. They're not a zoo, right? So that's the big one. So I want to spend, thank you for spending some time with me, having this conversation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. If you want to take off and run, I'm perfectly fine with that too. Um, but again, thank you. And,